And now, back by popular demand, I bring you our co-presidents who have been working extraordinarily hard and have achieved so much in their short tenure. Uh, we are so grateful for the path that they are crafting uh, for our next president and for our association. I give you Reverend Sophia Beckencore, Reverend Bill Sinkford, and Leon Spencer. In a normal year, the President's and staff report is an opportunity to celebrate achievements, to hold up examples of how we are living our faith in the world, and invite thanks for the dedicated work of the UUA staff. We do want to begin this year by giving a shout out to the staff. They are there every day to support your congregations and our ministry as we proclaim our message of hope and love. From the senior managers and program professionals to the administrators, the experts in finance and information technology, from the leaders in stewardship and development who invite our generosity to the staff that lovingly maintain our facilities, we owe them all a debt of gratitude. Would the UUA staff please rise? and receive the thanks of the assembly. Even in this difficult year, the staff has been moving ahead, strengthening important partnerships like that with the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, you will be hearing more tomorrow about the College of Social Justice and the important new Love Resists campaign. The staff has also been moving forward to support the diversity in our ministries, deepening and broadening the educational and worship resources that we make available, strengthening our communications networks. Much has, in fact, been accomplished. And the staff has welcomed all three interim co-presidents, and I want to thank them personally for welcoming me back. In fact, the password on the computer I was given in Boston is, Welcome back, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you can read details in the staff report, and I know that you are all competent readers. But let's give them one more hand. We, your three interim co-presidents, are completing our brief weeks of service, the shortest interim in the history of the Unitarian Universalist Association. And in point of fact, there has been scant time for normal interim work, and there is no playbook for a presidential transition like this one in any event. But we have observed and listened with intention and we thought it would be helpful first to report back to you what we have observed and what we have learned. Next, we were given a specific charge by the Board of Trustees. We want to share with you how we heard that charge, how we interpret it, and how we have tried to address it. And finally, we want to share some conclusions that have become clear to us and name some questions we need to pass on as we search for that path that is calling us toward hope. So first, what have we learned? We found a religious community in a state of shock. The charges of racism in hiring shocked our community. Many white UUs asked, how could this be? But most UU people of color were not surprised. 
only surprised that it had been called out. And that difference in reaction was itself a shock and a challenge to our community that we want to call beloved. The resignation of a UUA president was unprecedented. The resignations that followed made many ask what was really going on. Just how far had our practice veered from our principles? We have not attempted to find one truth about these events. We've heard many versions of the truth in our short tenure, but we are certain about the shock. Our presence has felt less like interim ministry, in fact, and more like after pastor work, post-traumatic, but we are truly not yet after the trauma. The trauma is not yet past. We are still in its midst. We found a staff that was dispirited and anxious at times about the future. Now, anxiety itself is not unusual in a presidential election year, but it was deeper this year. The staff of color felt particularly vulnerable, hopeful. Thank you. Hopeful because the unspoken truths were being spoken but vulnerable. We found our national volunteer leaders stunned and struggling to keep up with the changes, decisions, some changes they had initiated, like the financial commitment to support black lives of Unitarian Universalists, but some out of their control. They are now dealing with the unexpected grief and loss at the sudden death of moderator Jim Key. We found that boundaries between staff and board and the clarity necessary for good governance had blurred beyond good practice and needed to be reestablished. We found a community of congregations willing and open to serious conversation about race and culture open it once again. Some opened the conversation for the first time. For many, we found a national institution that was in shock, shock and grief, that was angry, that was anxious, an institution that was vulnerable and fearful. Vulnerable, fearful, and institutions serving a community that itself was shocked, but community that was willing to be hopeful one more time. As we were moving into our interim roles, our congregations were being asked to engage their own culture of white supremacy. That invitation was extended by, by Aisha Hauser, Christina Rivera, and Kenny Wiley, three religious educators. Amen. And it's important to note that that invitation came up from within our community rather than from the top down. And over 700 of our congregations took part in some form or fashion. And I'm curious, how many of the congregations represented here took part in that white, uh, white supremacy teach-in? Look at, just look around. Just as we received national visibility, we did not want, as a result of the charges of racism in our hiring and the resignations that followed, we discovered that much of the religious world was watching this attempt to see our culture and structures of power with enough clarity to imagine changing them. Many were watching the association's financial commitment to blue and hoping, however tentatively, that Unitarian Universalism might be charting a path they would soon need to follow. We found a faith community living in grief and in anxiety, while at the very same time living in hope. When we accepted this interim leadership, we were given a specific 
and extensive charge by the Board of Trustees, calling for the creation of a Commission on Institutional Change with specific deliverables. And the Board also passed a motion calling for an independent racism audit for new hiring procedures with new goals set, with an invitation to our congregations and related organizations to join with us in this spiritual work. Our charge runs to two pages. The racism audit motion to another two in 12-point type, single-spaced. <laughs> On our first day, we invited Sarah Lammert herself, serving in the interim role of Chief Operating Officer, and moderator Jim Key to join us in a leadership team we called the Quintet. After Jim resigned, Vice Moderator Denise Rimes joined us. We knew that shared leadership was necessary, even as we each pursued our individual pieces of the work. The collaboration deepened of our work and provided us with collegial support. It also allowed us to name and begin to restore the boundaries which had become so blurred. The first item of our charge was to ensure and direct pastoral and professional support to the UUA staff members of color, as well as professionals of color serving in the larger association. We have talked, would listen to religious professionals and laypersons of color in face-to-face -face encounters, conference calls, visits to congregations, Zoom meetings. The staff of color were already being convened regularly by Tequina Boston, and uh, we have been welcomed into these gatherings. We have listened. And in listening, we've heard almost universally, felt levels of hurt, anger, sadness, disappointment, and loss of control, or trust. There are familiar feelings for many pe people of color. Having heard leaders who are trusted hear their feelings, their feelings about an ap appreciation. We have done much listening, but not enough listening. Changes in our practices are indeed necessarily and needed. It is the possibility that this faith might finally begin we have finally begun to create a culture without white supremacy as a space. That is, that is where we heard the hope, that is where we heard the hope and good news, really, from Unitarian Universalist leaders of color. Truth-telling. Truth-telling truth is not a single event, not a one-time thing. Truth is a process, and in many ways, the central quality of the beloved community is that it be a place where the hearing of all stories and the valuing of all truths is standard and expected necessary. It is crucial that we make a commitment to such an ongoing process of truth-telling as we move towards reshaping our faith community. The Commission on Institutional Change is charged with the creation of a truth and reconciliation process, not event around the recent events that led to our appointment. That is most certainly needed, but we hope the Commission will help us to build 
a truth and reconciliation into the DNA of this faith. Amen. Interim supervision of the UUA's Leadership Council was called for in our charge and has been provided. Our presence has been welcomed by these leaders, we are told, and the resignations have not continued. Only time and leadership decisions of a new president, however, will determine whether that stability continues. We were also charged to restore both confidence and vision among our congregations and among donors. This was perhaps the most unrealistic element of a charge for an 11-week interim. Our approach has been to offer regularly, regular weekly updates to the UU community at large, reporting on our work in specific areas. We have, frankly, and we're very pleased that you have received them so enthusiastically. We have, frankly, relied on our personal credibility to inspire confidence. A rigorous analysis I'm not sure you're ready for this next one. <laughs> a rigorous analysis of the operation of white supremacy culture might well call this spiritual domestic work, a phrase coined by Rosemary Bray McNatt, spiritual domestic work for us as person of color leaders. We have tried to make tolerable this use of our persons and our reputations by our refusal to be anything other than honest about what we have found. We have met several times with the UUA's President's Council, written to many of our donors, and met with individuals to answer questions and provide some assurance. Working with Mary Catherine Morn, and leaders in our stewardship and development staff group, we have begun plans to support the board's financial commitment to Blue and expand the association's support for our racial justice work overall. All of our congregations will be invited this November to conduct worship centered on racial justice to join in an effort called the promise and the practice of our faith, and to take a special collection in support of the transformation of our culture. We hope that you will urge your congregations to join in that effort. Please. Please. <laughs> The second element of our charge sounds the fundamental challenge of this time, to call upon Unitarian Universalism to redeem its history by planning for and taking steps toward living into an anti-racist, multicultural future. We might say to progress toward an anti-racist, multicultural future. This portion of the work speaks specifically to the need for review and revision of recruitment and hiring practices of religious professionals of color in addition to the creation of an assessment process and strategy for dismantling the culture of white supremacy within Unitarian Universalism. Clearly, the portion of this charge is that of sowing seeds for a much longer piece of work that will anchor us firmly in our primary values as we move ever closer to building the beloved community. To that end, the board charged us to create and submit for board approval a process by which to analyze structural racism within the UUA. That process will include an external audit of the operation of white privilege and the structure of power within UUism, as well as power structures and power mapping within Unitarian Universalism. 
The board assisted us directly with this task by passing a racism audit motion that outlines specific needs for assessment within the national staff of the UUA and board appointed committees, as well as a desire for collaborative efforts across our wider UUA. All of this leads to the establishment of the Commission on Institutional Change, a small and nimble group of UUs who will take up the long work of long-term cultural change, backed by the commitments of both your UUA Board of Trustees and national staff. We approached the construction of the Commission by first gathering together a group of respected leaders of color in our movement for a two-day meeting in Atlanta. We worked together to interpret the charge of the Commission to draw on our history to gain tools for this current moment of opportunity and to identify key priorities for the work. We also held meetings with a wide variety of stakeholders and constituency groups really listening to your hopes for this moment of profound possibility. From that input and wisdom, we appointed a six-member commission that will work collaboratively with an outside organization to bring badly needed analysis, visioning, and theological depth to the work of institutional change. That commission may work for 18 months or more. In our conversations about this important aspect of our charge, we learned that there is an immediate need for a truth and reconciliation process centered on the events that precipitated our latest conversation around the impact of white supremacy on our faith. There is also a clear desire for the Commission's work to be broad and far-reaching. This work is relational and theological and must unflinchingly question cultural habits and norms that hamper us in our yearning to build the beloved community. In collaboration with our acting COO, the Reverend Sarah Lammert, and based on our recommendations, your Board of Trustees has unanimously appointed this group of phenomenal leaders. These are their names in the order from left to right. It is worth applauding their service. <laughs> So your newly appointed Commission on Institutional Change is the Reverend Natalie Fenimore, Caitlin Breedlove, Mary Byron, the Reverend Leslie Takahashi, who will serve as our chair, Dr. Elias Ortega Aponte, and Duro Farrar. We are grateful, so grateful for these leaders. I myself will serve as a transitional support member for just a few months to support the Commission's work as it gets underway. This is work that requires every one of us. And I hope that if you, your congregation, your affiliate organization or other UU connection are invited to join in this dialogue and to engage with the work of the Commission that you will answer with your most faithful and generous yes. Can you do that? Yes. yes, thank you. Together we will live into the love and justice that already exists at the heart of this movement. It matters that we pause, really pause and thank those whose decades of dedicated work to dismantle systemic racism and oppression in our movement brought us to this moment of renewed possibility. Can we thank those leaders? For your, for your tirelessness, your stick to itness and your faithfulness, we give thanks. We also want to thank and acknowledge the work of Jesse King, Amen. who worked with us as a consultant over this interim period for his strength of insight and vision, as well as the generous contribution of his time. 
He doesn't like to be acknowledged like this. Give we wouldn't have gotten this far without his efforts. Thank you, Jesse. The board also charged us specifically to determine the necessary measures to make concrete progress toward expanding the number of professional people of color, including but not limited to ministers and other religious professionals employed within Unitarian Universalism. This includes particular and measurable emphasis on senior staff positions, including the executive and first management level of the UUA. Our first act as co-presidents on the very first day, I believe, was to put in place a modified hiring freeze. Beacon Press was accepted as they have been very intentional in their hiring and already exceeded any standards we anticipated setting. And you can applaud Beacon for that. <laughs> Frankly, Beacon Press became one of our resources for both ideas and inspiration. And we added Jessica York and Carrie McDonald, both persons of color, to the Staff Leadership Council. We move forward with new interim hiring procedures that set ambitious goals for leadership by persons of color on the UUA staff. From less than 20% persons of color and individuals and in indigenous persons overall, which is where we are right now, 30% is the new goal, a 50% increase. And from less than 15% at the executive and first management level, we established a goal of 40%. The priority here is centering the voice and presence of persons of color and indigenous persons at the decision-making level. Our corporate council is here, and I should tell you that these goals, with their focus on persons of color and indigenous persons, have pushed the limits of what procedures are legally permissible. It should be noted that with the three co-presidents and the addition of Jessica and Carrie to the Leadership Council, we virtually achieved that 40% goal on day one of our service. <laughs> virtually achieve that goal at the executive and first management level, but not at the critical second management and professional level where the hiring controversy originated, and not permanently. When the co-presidents step down, the Leadership Council table will again have fewer than 25 percent persons of color seated around it. However, New procedures and ambitious, in our judgment, appropriate goals are in place, at least for the interim. Many of the specific elements called for in the racism audit motion will be taken up by the Commission for Institutional Change. There is one truth, however, that we want to make clear. This work will fail if it is not embraced by our congregations and related organizations. The UUA, its president, board, and staff have no control over either. But the UUA can and must issue an urgent invitation for all of us to join in this reflection and this reshaping of our culture. And finally, there are some conclusions we have reached and some questions we would pass on as we complete our short service. First, and most important, it is crystal clear to the three of us that the inspection of our culture and how it impacts persons of color, how it impacts all of us, is urgent. It is overdue. The risks of failing to engage these issues are enormous for this faith. Change must come. 
if our faith is to thrive. Second, our history reveals a pattern that could not be clearer. We have repeatedly engaged in issues of race, begun investing resources, both financially and spiritually, only to turn away from our engagement. Without those resources and without the attention, without addressing the fundamental cultural issues, we have stopped short of real change every time. This time, our prayer truly needs to be one of persistence. Third, because we have started so often and actually had some success, we know some things about how to engage. There are resources in our own history on which we can draw persons we can call on, models we can use, wisdom that can make this attempt easier and more productive. Not easy, but easier. Fourth, there is trust that must be restored. <laughs> trust must be restored and it is built over time. Trust is built out of experience, not based on promises alone. This process will not be quick and is likely not to be efficient, but we know that the value of efficiency is actually an element in the culture of white supremacy. Efficiency is a value in a culture of scarcity. Efficiency is a value in an economic culture. Efficiency is not a virtue in matters of faith. We need to move to a culture grounded in spirit, in which we live out of generosity and into abundance. Fifth, people of color and indigenous people carry extra water in a multicultural community, in, particularly in that community engaged in transformation. You hear my hesitation. You hear my hesitation in reading because I'm here reading this and feeling my back at the same time. <laughs> and I said, what a real metaphor mm. this is. They we therefore need extra space and additional support. And when people of color staff are called on outside of their job responsibilities to provide resources and wisdom, they need additional compensation as well. Much of what we have to pass on, as you've heard, is of a cautionary nature. But the final message we would pass on is a message of hope. There is a reason that people of color have become Unitarian Universalist from the very beginnings of this faith and still today. There is a fundamental hope in our values and our aspirations that speaks to persons across the boundaries of race and culture and language and economic circumstance and ability. It is the empowerment in our Unitarian legacy and the love of our Universalist promise that draws people to us and that keeps us here. It is our culture, not our theology, that has been our biggest obstacle. And because that is so true, our final message is a message of hope, because we can change our culture if we have the will to do it.
Many communities are watching Unitarian Universalism again as we engage this work. They are watching. They are watching because they are looking for hope. What will be different this time? They want us to succeed because they know that our struggles will soon be their struggles. Both for us and for those around us, the time is not fundamentally about problems. Not about problems, but about our promise. It's fundamentally about hope. The final element of our charge is to ensure a smooth transition to a new president. We have worked hard to keep the candidates informed of our work. We have shared our concerns with all three of them in regular meetings. But here in New Orleans, leadership will pass to one of them. What model of leadership will emerge? A few elements of our own leadership may be worthy of note. First, woman in our presidency. First, layperson in our presidency. First, out queer person in our presidency. That'd be me. <laughs> First person with ability limitations in our presidency. First co-equal team leadership in our presidency. Perhaps, perhaps we have helped to open up, to broaden the image of what leadership looks like in our faith. Perhaps, no certainly, that's a good thing. We have worked diligently and we believe responded to our charge in all of the ways we could in 11 weeks. We would be less than honest if we pretended that our tasks have not weighed heavily on our shoulders and our spirits at times. But it has been a privilege to serve and a great privilege to serve together. We end our service then with gratitude. We have heard and felt the willingness of this community to engage, to not let this time of opportunity slip away. And we find ourselves convinced that we can move through this period together. And we therefore end our service in hope. And we thank you. <laughs>